Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be part of such a unique conference. Today I'm going to invite you to uh, listen to some music that you might not be comfortable with. It may be out of your comfort zones. Uh, but this is in order to consider a culture through a redemptive lens. Ethnomusicologist uh, Charles Seeger has urged us to consider that music should be studied both as a thing in itself and in relation to what is not itself. Through the lens of worldview studies, I similarly ask you to consider that a music culture is far more complicated than simply its music, and that the individuals who make up the culture are likewise complicated. Frederick Copleston once said that the question of human existence and meaning is bound up with the question of God's existence. To carry this further, John Bowker found suffering to be an issue pivotal to the religions of the world, across the world. As we shall see, the music culture that I will call the death metal culture, collectively, uh, a more extreme subset of metal genres, is built around exactly such, theme, such a theme as suffering. And is therefore the field, is therefore a field, excuse me, fruitful with uh, theological dialogue. The purpose of this research is to reject stereotypes concerning metal and to see instead a culture that is broken and seeking meaning and identity, a culture that is working through very complex issues philosophically, and a culture that sometimes just expresses those issues existentially. But let me preface by conceding that while issues herein discussed may be a bit overwhelming, I have labored to fit this into 25 minutes. This will nonetheless be a shallow survey of a complex culture. If you are a metal fan, I apologize if I do not address it as thoroughly as you would have preferred. Uh, further, it is difficult to engage the ideology of a culture if one has no familiarity of the music of that culture. Therefore, I have much ground to cover. Thank you for your patience. I will begin with a very succinct survey of the historical background of metal and the hardcore offshoot that I will call the death metal strand or the death metal culture. After situating it historically, I will discuss how some of the negative stereotypes developed and how this has hindered dialogue. Then we will look at only a few of the subgenres and uh, individually for the purpose of gaining insight into the culture's diversity. Finally, we will consider what are the more appropriately generalizable themes across the culture. I will conclude with some implications for cultural apologetics. First, a foundational um, issue. Many scholars have noted the significance of authenticity in the development and defining of cultural identity in, in music groups. Scholars further insist that authenticity is more defined by what something is not than by what something is. Such observations appropriately apply to metal. The issue of rejecting the mainstream was involved in ideological roots. However, as the culture received its pejorative labels, there arose a tendency for some to identify more specifically within the marginalization, and so it became less about the re rebellion to the mainstream per se and more about the individual victimization. So let's start with a little history, very brief. There are two strands of metal, the classic strand and the hardcore strand. So just for background, classic metal, the earliest style, took shape in the early 70s, growing out of the late 60s hard rock scene, which had developed from mid-60s blues rock. The late 70s punk movement significantly set the stage for the emergence of a new strand in the 80s called the hardcore strand. The earliest style is called classic, traditional, or heavy metal, sometimes just metal, though metal can encompass all the styles. This included uh, an offshoot of progressive metal, progressive when, when applied to metal or rock and roll genres, prog or progressive music, refers to an aesthetic fascination with progressive rhythmic concepts, complicated mixed meter passions, uh, excuse me, patterns, and unexpected transitions, etc. Then, an interesting thing about metal is that um, it's rare that a metal genre dies out. Rather, the, the uh, subgenres continue to develop in light of one another. So after the emergence of the hardcore strand, we start to see additional subgenres within the classical strand, like power metal, doom metal, etc. Uh, while there are many other differences, the easiest way of discerning which strand you are listening to, if you are a foreigner, is 
Uh, if you're listening to the classic strand, it's a, a good sign when you hear clean vocals, they tend to be high pitched, and guitar riffs that focus uh, more melodic guitar riffs. The hardcore strand actually happened in several waves and became very complex. It began with thrash metal, which splintered into three subsets, death metal, black metal, and grindcore. The second wave in the early mid-90s brought additional subgenres. Um, and finally, circa 2000, we have a new wave, the third wave, in which the two strands really com combined. They collided into a new genre called metalcore. Curiously, this wave brought an extremely high number of Christian bands, though they had already, the Christian bands had already been in the culture, and also a high number of straight-edge musicians, and I'll define that for you later. The best way of discerning that you're listening to the hardcore strand is when you hear the growling and the, and the screaming. Now, let's consider very briefly the background of common stereotypes. Some of the earliest labels, pejorative labels, uh, in the 1980s came from parent-teacher associations, insisting that metal encouraged violence, suicide, delinquency, and an interest in the occult. While such accusations held merit in context, they were not able to speak conclusively of the whole culture, uh, which by that in time included many Christian metal bands. And this further seems to presume that metal was necessarily prescriptive and never simply emotive. The notion of occultic involvement caught interest of several Christian circles and caused what has been termed the satanic panic. This resulted in two things. First, it helped solidify an identity within the secular culture. Now that the mainstream, which they rejected, labeled them pejoratively as anti-religious, satanic, occultic, guess what? There seemed to be an increase in interest in exactly these things. Second, now that these themes began to identify the authenticity of the metal culture, Christian metal musicians actually became marginalized from both sides. The Christian culture saw them as sacrilegious, while the secular culture saw them as posers, which is a pejorative counter-label uh, given uh, from, the, from within the authentic uh, cultural identity. Quite simply, Christian metal was deemed to be a contradiction. Christian metal could not be true metal because metal was now collectively identified as anti-religious. This actually led to the metal church movement uh, in which marginalized Christians began to congregate in an underground sense, having church services in which their own musical expressions were welcome as an outlet for worship and or meditation on theological concepts like spiritual warfare. So it's already clear that metal, uh, metal stereotypes are more harmful than helpful. But since the solution to ignorance is education, let's consider just a few uh, examples so that we can look at some of the similarities and differences between metal subgenres. While there's disagreement as to who the first metal band was, the first band that everyone agrees on is Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath is considered uh, the first metal band then. Uh, much of the early metal style is built upon a rhythmic groove or slow, dark-sounding uh, guitar riffs, usually harmonic minor. Note an emphasis when I play this clip on the high-pitched vocals. This slide, which is not conclusive, by the way, you can see how it's, it's problematic to say this thing is metal. There's actually many subgenres, and again, these are just a few. But just to position the sound of the next strand, my focus, the hardcore strand, remember that it came from the punk scene. <laughs> which, as I understand, you'll, you'll learn a lot more about that tomorrow. Um, so, from this emerged thrash metal in the 1980s. The interest becomes more rhythmic than melodic. Use of simplistic driving blast beats were barred from punk. And uh, I, this is actually... I use this clip because it fits the title and the theme of the conference and Justice for All. Um, but this clip that I'm going to share with you will not show you something else that emerged in the culture, which was a fascination with double-kick drumming. <laughs> 
but that's really going to inspire a lot of the other subgenres. Most importantly, because we're in the hardcore strand now, notice the vocals, a disgruntled shouting style. <laughs> sake of time, I have to move quickly. After the emergence of the hardcore strand, the classical strand involved in light of it. Power metal, for example, was deeply influenced by this new interest in speed and the double kick drumming. But since we're back to the classical style, note the clean vocals, a sign that you are indeed in the classical style. <laughs> It's all, it's all about the speed. Now, the most complicated group. Thrash metal splintered into three subsets. This was largely due to the authenticity issue. The hardcore strand had emerged into a culture that was influenced by, one, an aesthetic fascination with horror films, and two, an aural fascination with extremism. Therefore, central to the issue of identity was extremism. Quite simply, bands began to war over who could be the most hardcore. And so one of the early changes was that the vocals became more of a growl. And compared to growling, shouting really isn't that scary, so it kind of was seen as the weaker example, so thrash metal kind of disappeared, and these others took over. Uh, now, a preface here. It is more difficult to discern differences in origins of these um, subgenres because actually death metal grew out of thrash metal. Black metal grew out of thrash metal. Grindcore was death metal. So it's, it's very difficult for me to give you some early examples. So I'm going to give you some more polished examples. Um, death metal became largely identified by growling, rhythmic chaos, and atonal melodies. Black metal found extremism within an emphasis on satanic themes. This, this is, uh, let me back up. It is true that you can find satanic and pagan themes throughout the death metal culture, but it is arguably Arguably, only black metal that warrants the stereotype as satanic. Um, many of the early groups were known for burning churches. But to be clear, there are also Christian bands that imitate the stylistic features of black metal while also offering alternative lyrics. Interestingly, you will note that black metal is not usually as rhythmically heavy as death metal, but rather stresses an atmospheric sound uh, some of the focus on evil or dark sounding guitar riffs like the early Black Sabbath sound. And then of course, now that we have it, this drive uh, of a very fast double drum, uh, double kick drumming style. But notice that the vocals tend to be more shrill. So this is kind of a distinction. Death metal, you have a low growl. In black metal, you have a higher shrill. Also, black metal bands enjoy painting themselves like corpses. Uh, sometimes making it, using makeup to look like skin was falling off. So there's more, uh, in this case, of a, a visual and conceptual extremism than just an aural extremism. Finally, there is grindcore. Quite simply, grindcore is death metal in its most extreme form. Again, the whole point of the culture at this time was extremism, how to be the most hardcore. So many played metal as fast as they could and growled as deeply as they could. Or maybe scream in a very shrill manner. So now I'm going to go through all, all three of these examples. Grindcore. 
All right, now, for the purpose of breaking stereotype, here's a great example of why it would be problematic, if it's not already clear, to declare that all variants of death metal sound the same. Consider gothic metal. Death metal plus an aesthetic fascination for classically trained soprano vocals. Sometimes called Beauty and the Beast. So again, this culture is far more complicated than it tends to receive credit for. But finally, consider the, the subgenre that came circa 2000, metalcore. The curious thing about metalcore is that it brought with it a generation of musicians who stressed self-control, both Christians and, and straight-edge musicians, if, even if non-Christian. Straight-edge musician meaning somebody who's uh, embracing a hardcore lifestyle. All vegan, no smoking, abstinence from alcohol, things like this. Certainly, this is a stereotype breaker. Here, there is still an extremism, though, but rather than an external projection, it's an external representation of an internal control, the hardcore lifestyle in which one is in control of oneself. Metalcore is a blending of the hardcore and classical styles. Uh, this is observable, observable in, in both the interests of rhythm and melody. It's very melodic in some places, as well as the coupling of both growling and screaming. A special love of metal, uh, metalcore is the unexpected rhythmic break, breakdown and what's called chugging rhythm. So I'll let this play long enough for you to hear the breakdown. <laughs> note the galloping sound on the guitar, very popular in the culture. So, if we are to avoid stereotypes, what generalizations might be appropriately drawn? Uh, consider maybe a thematic unity in lyrical orientation. Say a few bands like Black Sabbath who were concerned with themes of anti-war protests and social injustice. The classical strand has primarily emphasized fantasy and battle, metal as a way of life and as power and victory over one's enemy. The Christian metal groups that emerged from this strand similarly emphasize spiritual warfare, rebellion still, but not against the culture, unless the culture represents something that they disagree with. It's more of a rebellion against the flesh and a conquering spiritual warfare. The hardcore strand is diverse, but there seems to be a thematic unity surrounding issues concerning evil. Thrash often stresses social injustice, um, and sometimes other issues. Metallica, for example, focused a lot on the question of free will versus determinism. Death metal, a lot of times you have themes of violence or horror or suffering. Uh, black metal emphasizes satanic themes or uh, rejection of God. Uh, grindcore, remember it's all about extremes, so it's not surprising that you get extreme violence, even cannibalism. And then uh, doom metal, which was a crossover genre, it shows up in both subculture, uh, in both strands, uh, emphasized despair. Finally, consider um, the lyrics of uh, the lyrical themes of the metalcore subgenre, which do sometimes build themselves around social injustice, um, but essentially it's the question of suffering. Interestingly, many bands of this strand, whether Christian or not, began to emphasize a positive spin on suffering. The last band that we saw, which is not a Christian band, though some members claim to be Christian, um, 
the lyrics were only through struggle have I found rest. So in this culture, you still get a lot of I'm dealing with suffering, but there's there's an end to it. I can get to the other side. So there are a lot of philosophical themes underpinning the metal culture, but it seems to really come down to the issue of suffering and what that's about. So at heart, you have this uh, nihilistic question. Um, is there meaning in the world? There is certainly suffering. Does one submit to despair? Or, in a Nietzschean sense, assert one's identity via uh, an extremist will to power? Theologically, this is tied up with the, the problem of evil. Um, is there a God? Why, why is he not doing anything? If there's not, what's that? We're back to nihilism. And I would ask you to consider that just like real conversations about evil, sometimes you find people who are ready to assert philosophical positions. But often you find people who are not yet ready to deal with the issue of the head. They're on the heart level. And so they bury themselves in the existential mourning. And it's the same with the death metal culture as well. So some conclusions. Um, it seems that whether sacred or secular, that this issue of, of suffering um, you find throughout the culture. In the classic strand, you get a lot of emphasis on fantasy and, and other things, but certainly within the hardcore strand, the death metal culture, there's a, the interest in what's all this suffering about. Um, so here are, are, are a few conclusions for cultural apologetics. Avoid stereotypes when you can help it. Uh, learn to listen. Uh, you know, not, it's not just about hearing the music, but listening to the dialogue. Seek worldview in the dialogue. We speak from positions. We speak about, we were talking at lunch, the, the world has meaning. If it, I mean, maybe it does. That's part of the dialogue, right? And so cultures are engaging this meaningful world. So seek dialogue as to what that's about. There's a lot of positions asserted, but sometimes not questions. For the Christians, two more things. Consider the redemptive nature of Christ. It, uh, we were talking about this at, at lunch, too. I, I love uh, Martin Luther's attitude on music. Yeah, it may be satanic, but we're going to use it to glorify God. All right. Um, consider in Jeremiah 29 where um, he's, he's saying, you know, you, he's speaking to the exiles, and he's saying, you know, you're exiled, and you're going to be here a while, but seek the good of the culture you're in. Um, as this applies to the history that we've talked about, if, if the Christian response is just to reject, to define their authenticity by rejecting a culture, then dialogue is hindered. You know? So, I submit that when one is ready to see a music culture as a dialogue of meaningful worldview issues, one will find in death metal a culture that literally screams out for an open forum. Thank you. Thank you.